Hello and welcome to another Mr. Smith video. Today we're going to be talking about castles, siege weapons, and armor of the medieval times. These mighty fortresses, like the one right behind me. Hi, Sandy. I named it Sandy. Get it? Because it's a sand castle. Uh, in all seriousness. Okay, so, okay, we're going to be talking about castles. Castles were the ultimate fortifications of their time. So let's talk a little bit about how this works. Okay, so if you look here on the very right, you'll see the big square piece labeled gatehouse. It's exactly what it sounds like. Okay, this is the gate. This is the way you get into the, the castle proper itself. Notice that this one has a drawbridge. The vast majority of castles have some kind of moat around them. Now it's not always like you see in the movies where it's this nice kind of almost river or lake that surrounds the, the thing. If it had water in it, it was nasty, dirty sewage. Okay, it was usually part of a river that um, didn't flow very well and had been diverted to fill the ditch. Um, and uh, all the sewage, all the, the feces and horse dung and all that other stuff and any other nasty thing they didn't want in the castle was dumped into it. So it was a nasty and festy, festering pit of disease. Now, a lot of castles had dry moats around them, though, which is basically just like a large ditch or canal without water. And why would you do this? Well, this prevents battering rams and guys with ladder and other siege equipment from actually getting up to the wall and provides more time for the people on top to kill them before they get to the wall. So it's a safety thing. Now inside the gatehouse, you have a large oaken um, iron bound door usually. And uh, on top of, and either in front of that or behind that, you have a large iron portcullis. Okay, this large grid of metal that uh, goes through. So it's a really tough deal to get through. Okay, next to the gatehouse there, just under that, you'll see the label for the well. And the well is actually there in the middle of the grounds. Every castle had its own water supply because in the event of a siege, they're going to be there a long time. And three days max without water is the best you can do. Now, so the, down there below, we have a flanking tower. These are towers along the outer edges of the walls. They serve as security. They serve as guard posts. They serve as uh, arrow platforms to shoot farther. Notice all the little windows in them, okay? These aren't actual windows. They're more like six inch wide slits that go all the way through the stone. And what they are is they are um, arrow holes, okay? You would stand there with a bow and you would be able to shoot out and they wouldn't be able to shoot back at you because, you know, it's a six inch hole. They're not gonna hit that from a couple hundred yards away. So that's great. Uh, notice uh, above the gatehouse there, we have something called an outside kitchen. So a lot of the cooking and stuff might actually be done outside. Uh, because of the heat and the smoke and stuff, keeping it indoors, and eh, didn't always work out so well. There are some indoor castles, or sorry, indoor kitchens and stuff in castles, but not a lot. Uh, so the turret, again, we talked about the upper part of the tower. This is where sentries are going to be, bowmen are going to be. Uh, they're going to use it for observation. They're going to use it for um, firing arrows long distance, all that good stuff. Uh, down below in the field area, you notice you have this something called a bailey. This is basically a large mustering field. This is where men-at-arms are going to be at. This is where they're going to store supplies uh, that don't mind the weather, like timber and stone and things like that. Now, this outer wall that goes all the way around the castle is called the curtain wall, okay? And it's the first line of defense. Some castles have multiple layers of curtain walls, uh, but generally one was what we see. Now, notice this big, large structure here in the middle, okay? It's called the keep. In this one in particular, it has an extra wall that comes out along the stairs. Okay, uh, that's not terribly common. Usually it's a large tower in the middle of it. Notice inside that the keep has several different levels and floors and that there's only one staircase that connects them. Notice that this is a winding staircase. Also notice that it circles and corkscrews up and to the right. This is so that a right-handed attacker has to keep close to that inner port and he keeps having that rounded wall right there. Okay, the, the narrow part, um, against his sword arm, whereas the defender who is facing down, okay, has a large open area next to him that allows him to swing his sword. So it's, again, it favors the defender. It's a defensive pattern. Uh, many of these stairs had ways, or were made out of wood sometimes, and they could be lifted out of the way or burned or removed to stop people from gaining access to the upper levels. The whole point of a siege is if you can outlast the people in front of you. Medieval times are not about hygiene. Hygiene is one of the things they do not do well, hence a lot of the plagues and sicknesses and stuff, okay? So, I mean, we're talking about the rich people who take a yearly bath. Yearly bath. Ugh. 
The rest of the time they just cover it up with perfume. Imagine 364 days of perfume on top of body sweat and stank and ugh, bad stuff. Okay, so hygiene is a problem for the attackers and for the defenders. The defenders especially. Castles are not clean places. They are damp, they are cold, they are dirty. Um, not a great place. Okay, and again, if that moat is filled with sewage and stuff, you're smelling that all day long. Not to mention all the bugs and stuff that are going to fester and grow there. It's bad stuff. But for attackers, you also have that same problem. They're going to have to worry about extended periods of time, disease. They're going to have to worry about um, uh, basic sanitation and not only the death and destruction they face taking out the castle, but you know, just it's not healthy to camp out there that long. You know, they just, they don't have uh, some of the, the processes that the Romans used to have, you know, the, 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 the traditions or the rules about how camps are laid out and things like that. So they didn't keep the sewage away from where they lived or slept or anything. It's just, it's bad stuff. Now, inside the castle, your job is to buy as much time as possible. And what's going to happen is that your friends and allies will eventually come and help you, and the other people will be caught between you and the castle and your buddies, and they will probably leave. Okay, or they will give up due to massive losses on their own, and they simply cannot maintain the siege. Okay, so your job is to buy time, hence the removable stairs, hence the multiple layers of defense, and all of that. Now, castles are incredibly expensive, okay, and they take a long time to build. And they are not these nice, beautiful things that we see, okay? You know, you ever see the Disney movie? The Disney movie starts, it's got these beautiful white towers and the flapping flags and all of that stuff. And uh, yeah, to be honest, that's not how castles work. Most of them are dank, squat, ugly little things that their job is made for defense. Often they're made on hills and other places. Now, how do you break into a castle, okay? Now you may call this a catapult. Its proper name is a mangonel. And what's happened is they've taken that, me uh, that uh, metal shaft or metal and wood shaft there, and they put it between a bunch of ropes and sinews that they've twisted very, very tight. This creates tension, kind of like when you twist a rubber band all up and put something between it, okay? So when they pull it back, it's gonna want to pull forward again. When they release it, it will throw. This is what we think of when we think of catapults and things that take down walls. But you see, this weapon doesn't throw a big enough rock to take down castle walls, okay? And making it bigger doesn't help. There's some physics involved, and it just doesn't work. Okay, this is an anti-infantry, anti-cavalry weapon. This is for smashing troops on the battlefield. Maybe you use it to pick off some defenders on the top of the walls uh, or to, you know, anyone that comes out of gate gets a face full of it, okay? But for the most part, what we're going to want is we're going to want something called a trebuchet, okay? So... We have a couple of different kinds of things that we call catapults, okay? This is called a tension or torque type catapult that we see here behind me, okay? Again, the mangonel, right? Catapult is a category. Mangonel is the name of this particular one. The Romans used something very similar to this, and its design is fairly old. The one the Romans used was called the onager, and it actually used a sling instead of a basket in the top. Okay, so again, anti-infantry, anti-cavalry weapon. This is the trebuchet. Okay, it's got a long arm with a sling on it and a rock in the sling. It's got a hook on the top uh, where the netting and sling can come off as it throws. It's got a big weight that swings there in the middle. Now, some of these okay, were actually used where people pulled them by ropes instead of using a counterweight that pulled it down. Uh, they would use ropes and stuff to pull on it and do it that way. But basically what you get is this huge whiplash effect that throws large objects extremely far with high accuracy. Okay. They're going to build these with uh, materials from the local surroundings. Sometimes they will disassemble them and take them with them. Uh, some of the largest ones ever built through stones that weighed several hundred pounds. These are the things they're going to use to pound the walls with. Now, you see, the thing is, though, with castles, though, you don't necessarily want to break down the wall. Because remember, there's a good chance that the buddies of these people are going to come along here soon. And your goal is to take the castle intact. So what, one of the things they would do that was interesting is they would actually throw dead, putrid, rotting corpses of cows. Go kill a cow in the field, let it rot for a couple of weeks or so, and take what's left, okay, this big pus-filled, gas-filled, maggot-filled pack of putrescence, throw it over the wall of the castle and let it go everywhere inside the castle. Okay, again, they're trying to spread disease within the castle. The people inside the castle will give up. 
Okay, the main point of siege warfare at this point is not necessarily that you break through the castle, it's that the people inside the castle get hungry enough, get discouraged enough, get thirsty enough, get sick enough, that they actually just give up. No, this isn't me. Would be nice, cool stuff. Okay, so we wind up with the armor. Okay, this is called chain link armor or chain mail. Okay, it's used against hacking and slashing weapons. Okay, it's great against the sword cuts and things that come against it. Not so good against axes, not so good against crossbows or uh, the long bow. Uh, piercing type attacks will still go through this. Its main thing is to stop you from getting sliced. Now, you're still going to get whacked, right? So often underneath it, they would wear a thick, heavy padding or quilted uh, cotton vest or thick leather padding underneath it that will help absorb that blow. These things are going to be hot. They're going to be heavy. Uh, a chainmail suit the size of the one he's wearing will probably wear anyway between 45 to 60 pounds, depending on how long it is, and uh, the makeup of the steel. But they're extremely fast to make, and as far as armor goes, fairly, uh, fairly cheap. Okay, now it's still hugely expensive, but again, fairly cheap as far as armor goes. Okay, so, and they're really easy to repair. Uh, you just take out the damaged rings, you replace the rings, and hey, off you go. Uh, you could make a pair of this and, you know, a good blacksmith might be able to make this and, you know, you know oh, depending on how many people were working in the blacksmith shop, might be able to make it in, you know, a few weeks to, you know, maybe a month tops, okay? Or maybe even faster than that, depending on uh, who's making it. The other type of armor we have is the standard thing that we think of when we think of knights, and this is called plate armor. Plate armor is hugely expensive. Only the extremely rich can afford this plate armor. It is extremely heavy, okay, and it is not as constricting as most people believe. They actually did an incredible job engineering these so that there was still a great range of movement, but they were still pretty heavy, okay? This is not something that then the reason knights are on horses and not just any horses, but like Clydesdale type horses, huge horses, okay? Think the Budweiser horses, okay? That you see in the commercials during the Super Bowl. Massive horses because, you know, the guy's going to put on another one to 200 pounds of armor when he puts this stuff on. It's extremely heavy, um, but it's great against pretty much everything. Um, hacking, slashing, crushing. You know, you pretty much need an axe or uh, a large pole arm type weapon to get through this, or you have to go through a chink in the armor, one of the, one, one of the spots where two pieces of armor comes together. But again, incredibly expensive. This might take, you know, uh, nine to 10 months or maybe even a few years to make. Um, and it was, again, incredibly expensive. Most of these are made to order. They are not mass produced because they are so expensive. And so very rarely do you actually see two sets of armor that are the same. Many of them are decorative. Um, they had a decorative function to them that makes them no less strong. Ladies and gentlemen, that's an overview of the weapons, armor, and siege craft and the castle functions and pieces. We will see you next time on Mr. Smith's videos.